Is there something that we should be doing for our gut health in addition to any other things you're recommending that would help with metabolism, weight loss, and just overall wellness? Whole foods prepared in healthy ways, delicious healthy ways, actually can do more for your health than a single injection that cuts off your appetite. We want nutrients to go into our body and our body to regulate it in reasonable ways. When you actually take a medicine, a shot, that actually keeps you from wanting to have your nutrients, you're actually blocking that human instinct to actually get what you need. We've heard of, I think it's called ozempic face. Like you lose weight in the in weird places first. That's what happens when you start messing with the mm -hmm. body's engine, mm -hmm. right? You're actually forcing it to do something that's not natural for it. You're gonna lose weight, but we want to actually lose weight in more balanced ways that are good for our body and are good for our mind and good for all the other systems. We are all forming cancers in our body all the time. We're forming little mutations in our body and those mutations, those little cells, can form microscopic cancers. If you prevent blood vessels from reaching a microscopic cancer, it will stay there forever. If you actually allow the first blood vessel to touch it, it'll begin growing up to 16,000 times in size in just two weeks. The body naturally can prevent blood vessels from growing. We can use diet to help the body prevent blood vessels from feeding cancers. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I uh, This has been a long time coming. I don't know when we got introduced, but it was a long time ago. And everybody who tells me about this man goes, you have to have him on. He's brilliant. He's special. He's different. It's not your run-of-the-mill nutritional or medical advice. And then I started diving into his work, and oh my gosh, is this going to be unbelievable today. So I have Dr. William Lee here today, who's got a book that you should get called Eat to Beat Your Diet, Burn Fat, Heal Your Metabolism, and Live Longer. Dr. Lee, thanks for being here, brother. Yeah, thanks, man. Great to be here. Yeah, very smart people uh, connected the two of us. And so I, uh, I want to start out. There's a big thing going on. We record in Hollywood. And so everybody out here is thin and, and losing weight. And a lot of them are doing it with these different shots that people are taking. I don't know if it's Ozempic or whatever these different brands are. That's just naming one of them. But we were talking off camera about this. It's yeah. like become the thing. You see somebody on TV who's lost weight or a friend of yours who lost a lot of weight in a dramatic time. They're probably on one of these three or four different types of shots that you can take that do something to you that cause you to lose a bunch of weight. So what's, what's the mechanism at work that causes these to get you to drop weight? And what are your thoughts about them? Yeah, well, first of all, this is sort of like the biggest new trend that has, uh, you know, that's always populated the weight loss industry and the people that follow them, which are millions, maybe mm -hmm. billions of people actually mm -hmm. that are pay attention to it because weight loss is such a, uh, or obesity is actually a growing problem. The, you know, all the trends of extreme dieting, fad dieting, crash dieting, mm -hmm. That's been around forever, right? But enter the dragon, which is really prescription drugs, which takes it to a whole other mm -hmm. level. The last time prescription drugs became popular was the opioid epidemic. Yeah. Okay. And I want to actually call out that because you know it takes it takes a physician to be complicit to say, all right, the patient wants something, I'm going to give it to them, mm -hmm. and if it's the right medical reason, and there are people who require that might require a medical intervention to manage their obesity. Mm -hmm. But it might also be surgery, it might be counseling, it may be, it may be these prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And that's what the FDA approved at least one of them for. Mm -hmm. But the problem is when patients or the consumers demand the drugs, mm -hmm. and then you know the medical community has to serve them up by writing prescriptions, I got a concern with that. Okay. And, you know, I think that's what we should talk about. What's your concern? So some of these, uh, so we, I think actually all the way back to Fen Fen days, I'm old enough oh, to yeah. remember that, where right. there, that was the weight loss thing. Now that was a mechanism of action that was causing heart attacks. People were dying from it. So now, just so everybody knows that, and I think most people do, but I think oftentimes, you know, if you live in certain parts of the country, things spread slower, right? But so there, are, there's a shot that you can take every day. That's one of these injections that many of my friends are on that are in Hollywood or that are just everyday people that have lost a lot of weight. There's another one that's a once a week one. Mm -hmm. I think that's the Ozempic one. And I don't know that I should be using specific names because I'm probably wrong. But so the concern you have is that it could, that we don't know the ramifications of taking these medications yet, or that you think they, because they were really prescribed originally for morbidly obese people to lose weight to save their lives. Well, here's the thing. 
These drugs were originally developed to treat people with diabetes. Okay. They were not intended to actually treat uh, people who are obese. And in fact, it's these drugs have become so popular that uh, diabetics actually are having difficulty getting their hands on the medicines to treat their diabetes, right? So this all goes back to metabolism, which is really what I wrote my book. To be We're going to get right about. into We're that. We're going to dive into that. But, but it's really relevant because the bottom line is that our body is hardwired to be able to control metabolism in reasonable ways. Mm -hmm. And what's connected to our metabolism is the fuel that we eat, which is food. Mm -hmm. And food is often demonized as the reason that we become, uh, we gain too much weight or obese, or the, co or the corollary is actually, you know what, just, you know, we should find ways to actually combat our obesity by cutting off our uh, willingness to actually eat. So that's basically how these um, drugs work. They're called GLP-1 agonists. Mm -hmm. What that means in, in layman's terms is that we got a receptor in our brain. Yes. GLP-1. And when you actually pull that, when you touch that trigger, pull that trigger of that um, button in our brain, it actually blocks your appetite. So okay. these drugs fundamentally just keep us from being w hungry. Wanting to eat. However, anecdotally, maybe I'm wrong. You correct me if I'm wrong. By the way, even if I'm, I, you correct me if I'm wrong. Friends of mine who have taken these medications get very sick for the first few weeks they're on them. I mean, we're talking about violent vomiting. Um, there's something happening beyond just the brain blocking your desire to eat because people, I mean, I, I know people who got very, very sick, can't tolerate them at all. And the doctor will tell them, no, if you just grind through another two or three weeks, the vomiting, the stomach irritation goes away. So is there something else at work happening beyond just the blocking of the receptor that's causing them to get sick? Well, here's the thing. These receptors in our brains are not uh, all or nothing, you know, isolated switches. Okay. The receptors in our brain, like GLP-1, is connected to our other hormones that okay. control our body. So when you actually start pushing that button all the time, mm. you've got a domino effect of other things. And uh, again, you know, there are people who actually could benefit from sure. these prescription medications, mm. including diabetics. Mm. And and uh, and so I think the, the, the issue is that it needs to be done under medical supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution. There are side effects you have to manage, mm -hmm. uh, and including some of the uh, uh, you know adverse events that you're just talking about, which mm -hmm. are things you don't want to have ha have happen. Mm -hmm. And there are other ways, maybe I would say better ways, okay. more ways that are actually more aligned with our humanity and our human nature, which is that, look, you want to eat, eat the right foods. Mm -hmm. You want to eat, eat at the right time. You want to eat, you let your metabolism do the heavy lifting for you. Yep. There is an alternative to prescription drugs. So the fact that sort of there's a, uh, a stream of people lining up to get these medicines does concern me as a medical doctor and as a scientist because A, uh, this is not what it's designed for, sort of mm -hmm. people that are not, who want to just get radically thin, mm -hmm. thinner, as mm -hmm. opposed to people who have a medical condition with yeah. obesity. Number two, it does cause, every drug has effects and side effects, mm -hmm. and I'm concerned about the size, scale of their use causing side effects. And number three, we don't really know what the long-term effects might be mm -hmm. in people who don't have diabetes. Okay, and we're going to talk about healthy ways to lose weight as well, which is your work. We're going to talk about metabolism in a second, too. Two more questions about these yeah, shots, these sure. drugs. Um, is there any mechanism at work? that is causing uh, glucose glucose regulation is that why diabetics were using it are you are you going to process glucose differently or is it just an appetite suppressant well it's pr it's fundamentally an appetite suppressant okay. so by cutting down your intake mm -hmm. of food including carbs you're actually going to have a better shot at actually getting your metabolism mm -hmm. uh, right sized mm -hmm. let's say okay. but well, here's what here's the other thing like i my background is in drug development i worked in biotechnology for almost 30 years mm -hmm. all right I, i've been involved with developing 43 fda approved treatments for all kinds of things cancer complications diabetes vision loss so i can tell you that uh, when drugs are developed oftentimes they will have unexpected benefits or sometimes side effects for conditions that we didn't expect at the very beginning, mm -hmm. conditions for which they were not originally designed. Mm -hmm. now, if you can actually harness that, which can be incredibly useful, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, metformin, which is also a diabetic drug, right. 
actually now been shown to reduce the risk of long COVID if you right. get COVID. It's also uh, been shown to have reduced the risk of some types of cancer as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not promoting any particular drug, but uh, there is a silver lining to rediscovering new uses, repurposed uses of, of pharmaceuticals. So I'm not by any means denigrating that. What I'm actually concerned with really is this sort of um, this widespread uh, enthusiasm to be able to jump over better, safer, more reasonable ways to control weight and to go for the prescription drug. It's funny that you say metformin because I've had a lot of friends who were actually taking metformin, which is also prescribed for diabetics from time to time too, but I've had friends of mine who were taking metformin get off metformin to take these shots because it's like metformin to some extent on steroids for their weight loss. They thought their longevity. Anecdotally, last question. Then I want to get into angiogenesis and yeah. metabolism, which and is all, all related. By things. the way, which is all related to this. Too, okay, because... I know, I know it is. That's why it's. It's. I wanted to start with the thing I know most uh, people's okay. minds. So this is just another anecdote. The people that I know that have taken this is probably a terrible thing to say. Have lost weight, okay, but they don't look right to me. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you aesthetically. Like they don't look healthy. A lot of people have said the same thing to me. Like, yeah. Sarah's lost all this weight, but it doesn't, is it just because she's, she's nutrient deficient now? Is that what I'm probably seeing on their skin or their, I, I just, they don't look like, I've had friends that have lost weight by working out and eating right, and they look a lot fitter and better than the people that I've seen that are on these shots, which is literally probably millions of people now. They don't look as healthy to me. Is that because there's just a nutrient deficiency, do you assume? Well, you know, it, there's probably a lot of different things that are mm -hmm. going on. Number mm -hmm. one, to be fit and to be healthy, we want to eat food. Like, we want nutrients to go into mm -hmm. our body and our body to regulate it in, a, in reasonable ways, mm -hmm. okay, with reasonable behavior. So when you actually take a medicine, a shot, that actually keeps you from wanting to have your nutrients, right. you're actually blocking that human instinct to actually mm -hmm. get what you need. You know that whole saying of listen to your body? Mm -hmm. Well, this actually basically just puts earplugs into listen to your body. You can't okay. hear okay. what your body says anymore. So number one, there's nutrient deficiency. Secondly, honestly, uh, to artificially promote weight loss in the manner of these prescription drugs, uh, in people who don't need it medically, again, I'm just keeping that caveat, the people, you know, you've heard of, uh, like, I think it's called ozempic face. Like you lose weight in the in weird places first. Yes. Right? And so you don't look right. Yes. And, you know, that's what happens when you start messing with the mm -hmm. body's engine. Mm -hmm. Right? You're actually forcing it to do something that's not natural for it. You're going to lose weight. But we want to actually lose weight in more balanced ways mm -hmm. that um, are good for our body and are good for our mind and good yeah. for all the other systems. And number three, you know, again, this back to the side effect, there is no drug that I know, no prescription drug that I know does not have side effects. And I guarantee you the people who are getting these prescription drugs are not taking the package insert out, which is that folded up <laughs> no. piece of paper no. from the drugstore <laughs> and reading not. that no, like no. Uh, whatever five point type right. that, you know, that mm. you need a, you need a magnifying microscope in order to be able to read. Mm. It's important to do that. Yep. Right. So, and, and my big question is, are the doctors are prescribing, are they actually adequately informing and instructing and following them up? Well, you wonder, and by the way, you're the researcher, you're the medical doctor, which is the combination is very unique that he's also been a researcher and a medical doctor. I am not. And so I'm certainly not making any recommendations one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked you the question. I'm just anecdotally know a lot of people on these shots and something doesn't seem completely healthy to me about the way they look. Um, having said that, if someone's lost 30 or 40 pounds, it's probably healthier that they've, you know, they're not carrying the weight. I, uh, I wanted to start with that because it's, it, these drugs haven't been around long enough for us to know what the side effects are. And now you've just got this tsunami of people that are taking them. So, okay, now let's shift into your great work because the things we're going to talk about today, his work is so unique and brilliant. We're going to talk, I mean, it's going to actually get all the way to, can we eventually cure cancer? We're actually going to go that far. But we're going to talk about metabolism. We're going to talk about food. But before we get to that piece of things, because the metabolism thing, even the fallacy of slow and fast metabolisms, you dispel that to some extent. But tell everybody, because this just, I've done a, I've had a lot of medical people on the show. And I've had a lot of anti-aging people on the show. And because it's a, a part of the work that fascinates me. The concept and process of angiogenesis I had heard of before, but I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. So for the edification and education of the audience, what is angiogenesis and why is it relevant? All right. Angiogenesis is a Greek term 
angio, blood, blood vessel, genesis, how they grow. Very simply, mm-hmm. it's a, how our body controls and grows our circulation. And why is angiogenesis, why are blood vessels important? It's because we've got 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels packed inside our body. And that's why, you know, no matter where you cut under your skin, you're going to bleed, mm-hmm. right? Now, and then if you, the deeper you cut, the more you're going to actually going to bleed. So we've got layers and layers and layers and layers. In fact, this is so extensive, a network that if you were to pull out every blood vessel in your body and line them up end to end, you would form a thread that would wrap around the earth twice That's circumference. Cool. So obviously this system is going to play a very important role right. for your health mm-hmm. because these are the bio, highways and byways by which our body delivers the oxygen that we breathe and the nutrients that we eat, mm-hmm. which activate, you know, keep every cell, every organ healthy. And when your blood vessels are healthy, you're healthy. Mm-hmm. When your blood vessels are sick, you get sick. Mm-hmm. Okay. And sometimes when you're sick, it also damages your blood vessels, which then causes a cascade, like the house of cards start falling apart. So mm-hmm. I got involved in angiogenesis more than 30 years ago because I was attracted by this idea. This network is so profoundly uh, ubiquitous in a body mm-hmm. that it's a common denominator of health and disease. Mm-hmm. And you know, as a young researcher, I was trying to, I was, I was admiring how so many researchers uh, go an inch wide and a mile deep. And they go into their vertical silo and know everything about a very narrow area. And yet, this approach has not led to any major progress in cancer research, heart disease research, right. Alzheimer's, obesity, diabetes, you name it. We have a lot of mile deep channels, but we don't have a lot of interconnections. So I thought right. maybe if we, if we study angiogenesis, the common denominator, maybe we could actually drain the Pacific Ocean of knowledge and figure out how all these diseases are interconnected. And that's basically what we've done. To look at angiogenesis at my nonprofit organization, the Angiogenesis Foundation, we figured out how blood vessels connect health and disease. And by looking at a common uh, threat, mm-hmm. we can actually bring new medicines, mm-hmm. but also we can actually bring diet and lifestyle in order to be able to harness our blood vessels so they work for us rather than against us. And, and the way that they work, and this is what I didn't understand, mm-hmm. I, I had heard some stat about how many there were. I did not know that the body has the ability to produce more of them or to prune them back based on different circumstances going on in the body, and these can cause and or cure disease right. to some extent. So talk about that a little okay. bit. Okay. So because our vessels, our blood vessels, support every function in our body, mm-hmm. we have, uh, and in fact, it serves as a health defense. It protects our health. As part of the defense mechanism, uh, uh, our body grooms our blood vessels. So think about uh, the landscapers at a country club maintaining the golf course, okay. all right? If the lawn grows too high, they got to take the mower out and get it back down. Right. And the body, when blood vessels grow too high, our body basically mows down the extra. So we don't actually have too many blood vessels to actually feed disease. Okay. Now, if you get a bald patch uh, in your country club, mm-hmm. what do you got to do? You got to resod it, okay, right. or seed it. And, and that body can do that too. If you have bald spots, bald patches, need more blood vessels, our body can grow them. Okay, so... Y'all hearing that? Let's just stay right there. I think that that's news to the average person. Okay. It was for me. So cancer, for example, Hmm. there's been an excessive amount of blood vessel growth surrounding a particular area. Correct? That's right. Whereas like heart disease or stroke, there's an insufficiency to some extent or hair loss. Exactly. For example. Or erectile dysfunction. Is the lack of vascular of, of more blood vessels or the function of the existing ones? It's usually that the that there's either too few blood vessels that have died back, mm-hmm. just like a lawn that doesn't get enough water, it just kind of dies back, okay. or the blood vessels that are there are not functioning properly. So they're there, but they're not delivering the blood, they're not delivering the oxygen, they're not delivering the nutrients. Um, so, so is the overall belief, I'm going to interrupt you a couple mm-hmm. times, is the overall belief that if someone's got cancer cells or a, a tumor, that if you could somehow get the body to begin to restrict the blood vessel growth around there, that you almost choke the disease? Yeah, here's, here's the actual eye-opener uh, that most people uh, have no idea. Okay. So we all, anyone listening to this, watching this, you and I, mm-hmm. we are all forming cancers in our body all the time, okay? Mm-hmm. From the time we're kids all the way until we're old. And, 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 and the difference is, um, and the reason is this, 
cancers form when there are mutations or mistakes mm -hmm. made genetically in our body. Now, mm -hmm. our body's 40 trillion cells, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of cells. Right. And it has to copy and paste itself pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're still around tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to try to ask you to copy a sentence I gave you on a word processor 10 times, you'd get it perfectly. If I do mm -hmm. 100 times, you're going to make one mistake or a couple of mistakes. Yeah. If I ask you to copy it 40 trillion times, you're going to be making a lot of mistakes. And our body makes, on average, 10,000 mistakes genetically copying itself every single day. What that means, we're forming little mutations in our body, and those mutations, those little cells that are mutated can form microscopic cancers. Now, those microscopic cancers can't grow very large because when, they're, when they form, there's no blood supply feeding them. Got it. All right? Now, what happens is that if they sit there quietly as a microscopic cancer, all right, without a blood supply, eventually our immune system will spot them like cops on a beat looking at a drug dealer sitting on the corner, all right, not dealing anything, not dealing yet, but that guy needs to go away, our immune system just wipes out the cancer. Mm. That's why we don't develop cancer more often. Got it. Now, the, when cancer cells figured out how to hijack, they release fertilizers, uh, proteins, that actually uh, cause blood vessels to grow towards them. Now, this is from the research that we've done. Um, if you prevent blood vessels from reaching a microscopic cancer, it will stay there forever. Mm -hmm. If you actually allow the first blood vessel to touch it, it'll begin growing up to 16,000 times in size in just two weeks. Oh my gosh. And the same blood vessels that feed the cancer allow cancer cells to escape into the circulation. That's called metastasis. That's mm -hmm. when you actually have a big problem. Mm -hmm. All right. So one of the big breakthroughs in modern medicine is understanding this fundamental principle of cancer growth. Now, the body naturally can prevent blood vessels from growing. And where the new, new stuff is, is that we can give medicines or we can use diet to help the body prevent blood vessels from feeding cancers. Okay, I told you guys this was going to be good. Now we got everybody's attention. Okay, so let's, let's go to diet. Let's meet in the middle okay. on diet. Okay, so now we know that the, by the way, we got to go diet, inflammation, et cetera, because when there's inflammation in the body, mm. is there something happening to the vessels that cause this inflammation? In other words, is, are the vessels inflamed? Is that what we mean when we say inflammation? Yeah, actually. So blood vessels are just there from the time we're born. Okay. And they're functioning uh, like uh, without a traffic jam. All the, blood all the blood cells are moving through it, doing, delivering what it needs to deliver. Okay. okay. Now, inflammation is basically like... Uh, dumping gasoline onto the road and lighting it on fire. Okay. And now traffic's going to slow. You're gonna, the road's going to start to bubble up and melt. Traffic's going to stop, and you're going to have all kinds of problems. Uh, you're not going to be able to drive right through. Mm -hmm. And so inflammation at a local area, like in one spot, is mm -hmm. bad enough. Okay. And, and how, what's a good example of inflammation that everyone can relate to? Think about it when you have like, uh, when you need a root canal, mm -hmm. all right, you've got inflammation in the pulp of your tooth because the bacteria has right, yep. gone down there and now it's inflamed. It hurts like stink. Yep. Everything is disrupted. All the blood flow is disrupted, mm -hmm. everything. You got to drill that out in order to be able to actually fix it or just remove mm -hmm. the problem. Now, that's only one spot. Now, think about whole body inflammation. Systemic inflammation. All right. Okay. Systemic inflammation is like a campfire that you would normally just tell ghost stories around and then put out before you go into your tent. Instead, the fire jumps out of the campfire, ignites the woods on fire, and now you've got a forest fire, mm. and it's everywhere in your body. Mm. You're not going to feel great, mm. all right? And a lot of people are walking around with chronic inflammation. We can measure it mm. in a blood test. You can see markers of inflammation. Sure. But inflammation uh, can trigger more blood vessels to ah, go into cancer. Okay. Inflammation can damage blood vessels. Okay. So inflammation in no way, shape, or form is good, is good for vascular health. Okay. Inflammation is important in the body, like pinpoint to wipe out an infection, Got it. and then it needs to uh, go away. Got it. So chronic inflammation is just a bad thing. Okay. So does food affect inflammation in the body? 100%. Okay. Let's talk about that. Go. Let's first talk about foods that can cause inflammation. Yes. So it turns out that uh, many of the foods that we already know are not so good for you. Fried foods, ultra processed foods, sodas, uh, they, they all actually um, have been shown to trigger inflammation. And this has been studied in the lab. It's been studied in the human uh, clinical trials. You know, you, get a, you have a little bit of a extra inflammation in your body every now and then, mm -hmm. probably not a big deal. But think about how we abuse our body by eating ultra-processed foods all the time. 
junk food, fried food, sodas. I mean, I know people who, you know, used to have like, you know, 10, two, two six packs of sodas every single day. Yes. All right. You're real big on sodas. No bueno, right? That's a big one on your list. Well, it, you know, the reason that soda is bad, I call it out is because a typical can of soda has about nine teaspoons of granulated sugar worth in it, right? So mm-hmm. if I were to actually give you a soda, you know, like and you, you pick the one that you like, um, mm-hmm. and, and we look, we all grew up with soda. It's a hot mm-hmm. day. You want to slake your thirst, yeah. you know, you, you down a soda, a can of soda. It's very natural. However, if I gave you a, an empty glass and I put nine teaspoons of sugar in it and say, hey, yeah. Ed, eat this. And you're going to say, no way, man. I'm mm-hmm. not going to do it. So this is, this is sort of the sneaky thing about like appreciating what we're putting into our body. And by the way, when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food. It's about how our body responds to what we put inside it. So when you put ultra processed foods with artificial chemicals, preservatives, flavorings, you put a lot of extra added sugar um, uh, one of the, and fried foods, which by the way, tastes great. I love a crunchy fried food like everyone else. Look, go to the carnival every now and then and knock yourself out. But I'm talking about daily Mm -hmm. consumption Mm -hmm. of this stuff or regular consumption of this. Mm -hmm. What it does is it sets your body on fire. All right. Now your body will naturally try to lower inflammation by itself. It's got the switch to kind of, it, it has a fire extinguisher to put out the fire. Okay. All right. But if you actually continuously pound away by igniting a new, like you're, you are your own arsonist lighting mm-hmm. up fires. All right. Your body's eventually not going to be able to win that battle. So that's one thing is by cutting down and cutting out the foods that actually spark inflammation. Okay. The other side of the equation is that, and this is the, this is the good news part. This is the silver okay. lining. Researchers like myself have actually been showing that there are lots of foods that can actually have anti- natural anti-inflammatory effects. And guess what? It's not just kale, although kale can do it too. <laughs> Ever kale. Not just broccoli and kale. Yeah. All right. But lots of tasty foods, everything from tomatoes to watermelons to guava, okay. pineapples, you name it. The foods that actually we like to eat okay. that are tasty, they happen to be whole, whole foods. They happen to be fruits and vegetables. Mm. You can find them in the, groceries, in the gross, regular grocery store. They don't cost a lot of money, okay. but they're very common. In traditional food cultures in the Mediterranean and yeah. Asia, uh, you know, I think that that's part of what we've done. We've actually gone, we've drifted far away mm-hmm. from the roots of our humanity into mm-hmm. this sort of mechanized industrial wasteland yeah. that actually is very pro-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. And if, you, if we just kind of rediscover our own past, you just got to go to traditional Mediterranean or Asian cuisines. You'll actually find, these are blue zone cuisines, by the way, mm-hmm. as you've heard, you know, yeah. where people actually live long and healthy. Yep. Right? Blue zones. This is like, you know, like the Mr. Spock of, of health is yeah. live long and prosper. That's where these guys are. They're not doing anything special. They've got anti-inflammatory ingestion most of the time. They're, though, they're right? exercising, sleeping. They've got good lowering their stress and they're eating whole fresh foods. Let me ask foods. you that about exercise. Yeah. Can exercise cause inflammation? Ah, very interesting. Yeah. So when you work out to yeah. exercise... You're actually breaking down muscle if yeah. you're deliberately exercising. Yeah. And why you build up muscle, which is what we're looking for, yeah. usually, looking better, getting bulking up, yeah. all right, is actually we've broken down the muscle and the body naturally repairs itself, regenerates. Yeah. And during the regeneration, you're growing new blood vessels uh, yeah. to, to grow more muscle. You're actually recruiting stem cells. These will actually, they're all packed in our bone marrow, and they come flying out like bees in a hive in order to regenerate the muscle that got broken down. So it's sort of like one step back with working out, and then two steps forward, and you're building up new muscle mass, new blood vessels, stem cells are regenerating the muscle, and you're going to be bigger and better. So that's the, so the recovery process yeah. is the uh, the beneficial stem cell blood yeah, vessel process. Right. The breaking down though. The only, I've just wondered this is a super layman question. But a lot of the same people who break their bodies down eat a lot of processed foods because they're eating a lot of protein bars and processed stuff like that. So I've just always not always recently thought, hmm, all these real fitness folks um, they drink a lot of pre-workout, right? Pre-workout stuff that's got all that crap in it or sugar in it or, you know, and then they break down the muscle and then they're eating a protein bar. And so it's a lot of the, the combination I just wondered about. I've never asked anybody that that's been on the show. Look, you know, here, here's what it is. The, the whole um, fitness industry, bodybuilding, weightlifting, high mm. performance mm. world, uh, you know, is all about trying to take, break down the processes 
of growing muscle, uh, improving fitness and endurance, mm -hmm. and seeing if we can actually um, add the specific things that we've identified to enhance that process. Mm -hmm. What we're realizing with food as medicine research, which is what I do now, is that food's not that simple. You can't actually just add a whole bunch of protein from one source or bone broth is gonna fix everything because it's got collagen in it. Yeah. When you do that reductionist, there's two things. Number one, you, I think you mislead, we mislead ourselves into thinking that there's easy fixes for it. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is that it, we might actually inadvertently avoid the more complex nutrients that we get from whole foods. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then you're, but this is what you put, this is the point you brought up earlier. Yeah. By going, by being hardcore mm -hmm. and focusing on a few products to build yourself up one way or the other, mm -hmm. you might not be actually eating a balanced meal. So you're missing nutrients. And it's not just, you know, the, the macros. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this whole new uh, galaxy of micronutrients that we're discovering every single day mm -hmm. that are absolutely amazing, including micronutrients that can fire up your metabolism and, and you can eat foods to burn fat, believe it or not. Okay, let's go there. But I want to finish. You, um, so good. So, so good. So uh, my audience knows when I'm really in it. I'm in it. So tomatoes, yeah. kale, yeah. watermelon. Give us two or three more. Just great ones. Green tea, coffee, dark chocolate, coffee. avocados. Um, okay. Let's come with chestnuts, um, lingonberries, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, um, mm. uh, chicory, uh, um, escarole, uh, okay. radishes, carrots, artichoke. Mm. I mean, you name it. Uh, okay. And by the way, it's not just it's not just veggies. All right. Okay. I mean, I, listen. I I am all for plant forward diets, sure. but I don't like to call them diets. I just call them like eat delicious foods that you can actually find in the produce section. Mm -hmm. But actually it turns out that uh, seafood, uh, fish, omega-3, marine mm -hmm. omega-3 fatty acids, uh, not just fish, shellfish, mm -hmm. crabs, crustaceans, squid, octopus, things that you would find on the typical coastline, all right, mm -hmm. uh, all can actually activate your body in lots of your body's health defenses, keep your blood vessels happy, activate your metabolism. Yeah. This is what we're discovering is that whole foods prepared in healthy ways, delicious healthy ways, mm -hmm. actually can do more for your health than, as we started this conversation off, mm -hmm. a single injection that cuts off your appetite. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk one more question before foods that go into metabolism. Yeah. But I want to ask you, I want to go back to the soda sugar thing okay. that we were talking about earlier. So friends of mine go, yeah, that's why I don't drink Coke anymore. I drink Coke Zero. Or it's why I put um, stevia on my, in my coffee and not sugar. So there are sugar substitutes now. Are, are any of them better than other ones that you would recommend? Are there some that are just as dangerous as the sugar? Because a lot of the, even the, the stuff we eat that we go, hey, it's got less carbs or protein. It's got these substitute sugars in them. Right, right. I'm um, thinking of stevia. Splenda, these uh, these various other ones is one is raw stevia better than what's is there any of those any good? Look, it's a it's a big question, right? Mm -hmm. Because our our bodies, our brains naturally crave something sweet, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's it's hardwired into us to like search out for energy. Mm -hmm. So there's there and so I don't like to demonize food, but I do want to call out specific foods. By the way, for sodas like regular sodas, it's not just that it's got sugar; it's got a lot of sugar. Okay, <laughs> it's that it's the it's the quantity, the volume, and the frequency. The dose makes the poison, as I actually say in yeah. medicine. Yeah. Right, a little bit, not so bad. Huge once in a while, huge amounts or on a regular basis. That's where you get you get into trouble. Okay. So the added sugar overwhelms your metabolism and derails your metabolism. So that's no good. Okay. Now, what about those artificial sweeteners that are mm. so popular? The you know the zeros. It turns out that in by the way, I was in medical school. Uh, years ago, when they first started put these non-nutritive sweeteners, artificial sweeteners and sodas, something didn't sit well with me yeah. from the get-go. Like the sweet right. and lows back in the day. Uh, you know, like yeah. it ta it doesn't. You know, you talked about yeah. like people that you know is like yeah, it's something's not something's a little yeah. off. I always felt like when I tasted like artificial sweeteners, mm -hmm. like the the diet sodas, you know. It's not the real deal. Um, I'm not getting satisfied myself right. with the with the purity. Like the, the experience wasn't real. Mm -hmm. All right, it's kind of like uh, uh, virtual sweetness. Okay, <laughs> it's true. Uh, right. Yep. Uh, and and here's the thing. And we're beginning to discover this now. Certain people who take, uh, uh, you know, some people who actually drink 
uh, artificial sweetener sodas, they actually gain weight. And that was a big mystery. Like, wait a minute. Right. There's no calories. It's it's called zero for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's true that the sugar, there's no sugar in there that would actually spark your insulin and, you mm -hmm. know, cause you to uh, kind of have extra fuel in your body. But here's the problem. It turns out these non-nutritive sweeteners, and this is very new research, tumbles down, unabsorbed by your body. Not the insulin doesn't rise, but they tumble down to your lower gut, your colon, mm. where they actually start to destroy, disrupt, poison your gut microbiome. Oh boy. They actually destroy your gut health. Mm. And so, although, you know, a lot of the big soda makers actually say, well, you know, the evidence isn't in yet. I'm a researcher. I can tell you, yeah. I got to call a shoe a shoe. The data is pretty compelling. Mm. Whether you're talking about aspartame, uh, sucralose, uh, you know, uh, saccharin, you know, you start naming them, mm. make the list. And in fact, you know, I've started to see uh, things like stevia also uh, in this category. Mm. Some of the research is being done now. It's a new research, but it's pretty, it's starting to build up. The evidence is starting to build up. All right. The smoking gun is starting to appear mm. is that these non nutritive sweeteners don't actually cause our insulin to spike, but they, what the happens, they damage our gut microbiome, healthy gut bacteria. When our ecosystem of healthy gut bacteria is damaged, we or not gut healthy. Mm -hmm. Turns out our gut microbiome helps to streamline our metabolism, helps us our glucose sensitivity, mm -hmm. helps our insulin. Mm -hmm. So you start damaging that, guess what? You're going to start gaining weight. Yeah. Your metabolism's derailed. So inadvertently, yeah. mm -hmm. ironically, you miss the sugar hit. Yeah. But you still wind up gaining weight, yeah. and your metabolism is still messed up. Really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. All right, metabolism. I did not know this. So, you know, there's this adage that, hey, when I was young, my metabolism was faster. And then, you know, I hit 30, and it slowed down. Or so-and-so's got a faster metabolism than I do. So the first thing, let's establish a basis that you've, your research tells you that there's really like four phases of metabolism or four types of metabolism that's not necessarily true these adages of age and metabolism necessarily, correct? That's right. This L is huge, everyone, right here. L huge. L listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw myself under the bus as somebody who went to medical school okay. and okay. went into practice, and I keep up with medical research. Um, I thought the same things that everyone else thinks, is that you know, somebody skinny has got a fast metabolism. They don't need to worry about the food they eat. Right. Somebody who's heavier, they got, they got a slower metabolism. I also thought that people reach middle age, their shape's going to change, your metabolism's going to slow down, and it's mm -hmm. just natural, and, and that's the way it actually is. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you everything changed about two years ago when a massive research study, in fact, the largest study of human metabolism ever conducted, was published in the journal Science. Now, Science is a journal, a medical journal, a scientific journal that publishes fundamental human discoveries. Things yeah. in science change the way we understand who we are and the world around us, all right? So it's a big study, and it was led by a researcher named Herman Ponzer, who's at Duke University, mm -hmm. and he actually led 90 other researchers. This is a big research study. Usually you got a, a handful of people involved with the research study, 90 people, researchers from 20 countries, every continent, except for Antarctica, okay? okay. Um, no, no researchers on the ice, okay? No one wanted to go there to do no, it. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, 20 countries, and they studied 6,000 people, mm -hmm. all right? And they studied them all the same way for metabolism. So this is the largest human metabolism study. They gave everybody a drink of water, okay? And that drink of water, what they did was really clever, all right? They, um, the scientists manipulated water, which is H2O, H for hydrogen, O for oxygen. They tweaked the hydrogen, tweaked the oxygen, so you can measure them, all right? Okay. And so they gave everybody the drink of water, and they measured the metabolism on their breath. When your breath comes out, how did the body's metabolism change the hydrogen and the oxygen, mm -hmm. process it? You can measure it in the bloodstream. You can measure it in your urine. So they can measure it. But in, by the way, there's one last twist to this research that is the jaw dropper. Of the 6,000 people, they studied the entire human lifespan. They included people that were two days old, newborns. Okay. They gave them the same drink of water. Okay. All right? okay. And people that were 90 plus years old at the tail end of life and, they, and everyone in between. Okay. All right? So what did they find? Well, when they actually looked at what, the, what this metabolism looked like for 6,000 people from 20 countries, different shapes, different ages, different races, different diet, different everything, all right, here's what they found. The, the first look, first blush of research, all right, they had metabolism was all over the map, hmm. okay? Just like you'd expect, right? Yeah, yeah. All right? But now we're in the age of supercomputing. 
-hmm. We have data crunching our, in our power. What they did, it was really clever. They created an algorithm that on every single subject, they, and they knew how, what the size of the subject was, their age, their body size, their weight. They could subtract from their metabolism mm -hmm. output the effect of excess body fat, excess body fat. And when they did that 6,000 times, Okay, and then they said, all right, when we remove the effect of excess body fat and metabolism, what does it look like? It was like pulling the cloak off the statue of David for the first time. Hmm. What they found, and this, is the, this was the, the really the mic drop for, uh, for human metabolism, they found that all humans are born, that all, are born with the same metabolism and actually all go through, we all go through four phases of metabolism through, over the course of our life. Every single person participates in exactly the same way. It is the operating system, Ed in our body, like a laptop that you buy from a computer store. If you went to the computer store, I went to buy to the computer store, bought the same model of laptop. Yeah. You went to your house, I went to mine, plugged it in, booted it up. The operating system would make it run exactly the same way. Huh. And that's exactly how our metabolism is. That's crazy. All right. But you know what? Actually, it makes sense. Yeah. When we're born, our hearts and our brains, your and mine, would, are wired to, to work the same way. Our kidneys are wired to yeah. work the Somehow same way. Somehow we can with this thing that metabolism is different in all of us, right? Well, yeah. we, we, yeah. Started to, we started to kind of make up that story because it kind of made sense. But let me tell you the real surprise. Mm -hmm. So not only we all, let me just go through the four phases. Yes. All right. Phase one is when we're born, uh, for the first year of life, our metabolism skyrockets like a spaceship. It goes sky high. It's 50% at one year old, faster than when you're an adult. And by the way, that's why it's so important, like what we're exposing our kids to. Um, right. You know, endocrine disruptors and the plastic bottles we're feeding mm -hmm. kids, you know, the, 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 the pacifiers that are all rubber, all that kind of stuff. Like all those phthalates and things that are in the materials we feed our kids can potentially affect and disrupt their metabolism because it's going sky high. 50, at one year old, 50% higher than an adult. Now, phase two is from one year old to 20 years old, right? We're going right through adolescence now. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's seen a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. Eating two or three dinners, bouncing mm -hmm. off the walls, growing like a beanstalk, yeah. you would think their metabolism is going sky high. Wrong. This research showed that between the ages of one and 20, our metabolism, human metabolism goes down, 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 wow. down, down. That's how it's hardwired, all okay. right? You're getting bigger, but your metabolism is going down towards adult levels, Okay. all right? Now, phase three, and again, this is really the eye-opener, I think, for the whole scientific world. Phase three is between the ages of 20 and 60. Guess what? That's right through middle age. Metabolism is designed to be rock-stable, huh. does not change, doesn't decrease by itself. The operating system wants to make it our adult metabolism to be as stable as possible from mm -hmm. 20 to 60, mm -hmm. right? There is no, I'm 40, 45, not my shape. It's automatically declining. No, mm -hmm. that's not how we're designed. Mm -hmm. All right. Only at 60, phase four, 60 to 90, you have about a, a, a slight decrease. Okay. Only about 17%. All right, so when you're 90, your metabolism is about 17% of what it is when it was 60. Okay. But it should be 17% of what, what it is when it's 20. So really, 60 can be the new 20 cool. if you will let your metabolism do its thing. Hmm. Now, what about hormone levels? Is the reason when a teenager is losing weight because they're just spiking with growth hormone? All right. And, and the fact that you begin to potentially gain weight in your 40s or 50s is hormone reduction? Is there potential right. for so that? So listen, that, so hormones play a big role because hormones mm -hmm. affect our brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, all those, you know, we talked at the very beginning, we talked about the, the trigger mm -hmm. that weight loss drugs are, are trying to push that trigger all the time, that yes. button. All right. Well, it turns out that hormones... Uh, don't just push one button, mm. okay? They play the accordion. Yeah. There's all the buttons are being pushed all the time. Mm. And what happens is that the, the tune that it plays, that accordion plays with the hormones, actually allows us to, not just when you're adolescent, not just to actually um, start to slim down, but actually, in fact, quite, quite differently, deposit fat in ways that are appropriate for our gender. Mm. That's why women get shapely hips. Mm. You know, they, their chest gets bigger, their butt gets bigger. You know, mm. all the, let's say the, the Renaissance mm. uh, idealism, mm. you know, Michelangelo's, mm. uh, the, 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 you know, that's basically all due to hormones instructing where body fat gets placed. Now what happens, by the way, middle age, if metabolism is rock solid, why do some people actually gain yeah. weight and change their shape? Yeah. Here's what happens. Life 
happens. Yeah. All right? First, let me just tell you, when I say life happens, I'm talking about when you're 40, 45, most of us, you know, we're, we're in our careers, we got families, mm -hmm. and we have all the stressors that derail us from doing healthy things. Uh, you know, you've got financial stress and relationship stress and real estate stress. Yeah. You're worried about your kids, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, you've got so much, so much going on in your plate, you're not able to focus your attention like you were younger on working out, staying active, getting good enough sleep. And when you're stressed, you're not sleeping well. When you're not sleeping well, it derails your metabolism. Okay. And by the way, it affects your brain, so you start making different types of decisions. And now maybe I will reach for that bag of chips because it's nearby, mm -hmm. and, and as opposed to doing it. And maybe I won't work out because I'm a little bit too whipped Tired. tonight to actually do that. So all those things now enter the hormonal changes. Mm -hmm. They actually, you know, I, I've heard many women in middle age say this, like, pickle your brain in different ways. Yeah. Okay? And so now your behavior is also going to change. So it turns out that it's not that a slow metabolism causes you to gain body fat. It's the other way around. Excess body fat causes you to slow your metabolism. There we go. So that's why when the study stripped body fat out, the that's readings right. were more consistent. So the actual presence of body fat is what's trashing your metabolism. Exactly. Right. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. Almost. Okay. So, but but that's great news because if you can get rid of that excessive body fat that one time, right. your metabolism is just like everybody else's exactly. in your age bracket. Okay, so that's huge, number one. Just knowing that alone is a huge discovery. Let's talk. We're, gonna, we're out of time, and I want to get to a bunch of cool stuff. So let's first off, foods that are immediately triggers or anything we've missed on that that will just speed up metabolism, anything on that you want to make sure that we add prior and then also I want to ask you about the gut microbiome simultaneously because it's re I've had a, uh, Amy Shaw on a couple of times who's an expert in that. And is there, is there something that we should be doing for our gut health uh, in addition to any other things you're recommending that would help with metabolism, weight loss, and just overall wellness? Well, let's just dive right in for the, the bullseye here. Okay. Look, um, body fat is important mm -hmm. to our health because it's a padding, our fat is an organ mm -hmm. that actually releases its own hormones that help us um, draw in energy and okay. can, can cooperate with insulin. Our body fat is also really unique because one of the other things it does is um, it can fire up, certain kinds of body fat can fire up, and people who are in fitness will know this, brown fat yep. actually fires up uh, like, a, like a gas range in your mm -hmm. kitchen your all right mm -hmm. you know like that click 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 whoosh and now you can boil your water yes okay or cook your food well there's there's white fat and brown fat mm -hmm. all right white fat is wiggly jiggly it's mm -hmm. under your arms under your chin it's a muffin top mm -hmm. in your thighs and your butt mm -hmm. all right that's the stuff that you can see you don't like to see a lot mm -hmm. of people don't like to see it but that's white fat um but that's not the it's not it may be unsightly but it's not the most dangerous Fat. The most dangerous fat is also white, but it's packed inside the tube of your body. It's called visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And think about that as like packing peanuts inside a thin uh, uh, shipping box. Great analogy. You could pack a lot of those peanuts in there. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can almost crush what's inside that thin box. Mm -hmm. At arm's length, when you tape up that box, it still looks thin, mm -hmm. but it's really, really crushing inside. Mm -hmm. Visceral fat is like a base when it's in excess is like a baseball glove choking your organ then you light it on fire mm. and now it's causing inflammation that's the stuff where um, you've got whole body inflammation which sets up for heart disease damages your blood vessels puts you at risk for blood vessels feeding your cancer mm. okay uh, and probably uh, dementia as well mm. and it and accelerates cellular aging all bad okay. all right that's excess body fat mm. and by the way that inflammation derails the normal hormones that you're supposed to okay. uh, think. Now your body goes, uh, should we be absorbing more energy? Uh, I, don't, I can't tell. Should we be hungry? I can't tell. Mm -hmm. All right, so now everything has gone oh, wow. haywire. Excess visceral fat is bad. Now, that's white fat. Need a little bit of it. Too much is not good. You want to tame your fat. You don't want to suck it out or burn it out. Mm -hmm. You want to right size it. But the other kind of fat, brown fat, is amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, brown fat is not lumpy bumpy. And it's not close to the skin. You can't see in a mirror. Brown fat is paper thin, wafer mm -hmm. thin, and it's close to the bone. It's plastered around our neck. Mm -hmm. It's actually underneath our breastbone. It's under our arms like a girdle, all right, and a little bit in our belly. And what happens is that in cold temperatures, you've heard about cold plunges, right? Mm -hmm. Cold plunges um, fire up our brown fat. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a like a butane lighter, like a like a but a torch, whoosh, okay. Mm -hmm. And now you you've got a flame. It lights up. And what it does, the brown fat does, in order to get that flame, it's got to draw energy from someplace. Where does brown energy draw that fuel for its flame? 
it draws it from white fat. Brown <laughs> fat fights harm. Good brown fat fights harmful white fat by drawing down the energy. It uses the ammo of the fat, okay, mm. which is the harmful fat. So cold plunges will actually do it, activate it up, but so will a large number of foods that we've also discovered, okay. right? Every, things you can find in the produce sections, uh, tomatoes, avocados, carrots, um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, bok choy, uh, mm. uh, uh, onions, garlic, mm. all those things will actually light up your brown fat, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Pears will actually do it. And by the way, this has been studied not just in a lab, but in humans. You can actually watch um, people's brown fat lighting up. You can do scans on it. And then you can watch their visceral fat shrinking. Mm. How, do you, how do you see that? You can measure waist circumference. Well, you could do a DEXA scan too, but sure. basically you can watch people's waist circumference shrink. Their belt size gets um, uh, smaller, tighter. Why? Because inside the tube of your body, that visceral fat, that baseball glove is starting to shrink. So your belt size gets smaller. Interesting. So we can, so we've actually proven this. Now, what's really amazing is that it's not just in the, in the produce section. You know how you're not supposed to shop in the middle aisles? Yeah. Turns out that there are metabolism activating fat fighting stuff in the middle aisle. Beans, lentils, chickpeas, olive oil, capers, dried mushrooms, chili peppers, all these things. You do talk about chili peppers. Yeah, oh, yeah. I that. Yeah, chili peppers. By the way, chili peppers are really cool. Yeah. Chili peppers, now you take pepper flakes, you put it in your pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that that zing that you feel in your tongue, mm -hmm. all right, um, is caused by a natural substance in chili peppers called capsaicin. There's a capsaicin receptor in your tongue. By the way, it's not sweet, salty. It's not the umami kind of thing. It's a whole other. It's a whole other deal. Basically, it's uh, the capsaicin pulling, tr pu pushing the trigger on your tongue. When that happens, all right, you feel the burn. Your tongue sends a text message to your brain and says, "Hey, this this switch has been ignited." Mm. Your brain will actually release a hormone, norepinephrine, that travels down the nerves in your neck to light up the brown fat. Now, next time you do this, Ed, if you're actually uh, eating some spicy food with hot chili peppers, all right, uh, see, see if you can do it in a quiet room, all right, uh, close your eyes and feel the burn, and you will feel your brain releasing those hormones going down your neck. You'll actually feel the nerves lighting up, okay. and your brown fat will actually light up. So hot chili pepper basically is, a, by the way, this hormone that lights up the brown fat, it actually is a stress hormone, fight or flight hormone, which is why you sweat. Which is why huh. your your nostrils kind of okay. flare. Okay. All right, that's natural. So we're beginning to put the picture together. Yeah, it's all been hidden in plain sight. Back to this whole idea: hidden Should we be sight. injecting ourselves mm -hmm. uh, with stuff to it affects our brain to block yeah. our human nature? It just doesn't make sense. Mm. I have not said one food that would gain somebody, a bunch of weight, right? If you ate right, it, right? Uh, exactly. But yeah. you can't have too much food. Sure. All right. Um, and there's timing of food, like there's important, there's, there's ways to eat mm. around the daytime to actually mm. be smarter for your metabolism. But to me, part of our humanity is enjoying the food that we like right. to eat. You just said something when I asked you, I, it's, I assume that means you're a fan of intermittent fasting. You believe in feeding windows? I do. You said times of day. I, I do. But, you know, here's, here's what I tell people about intermittent fasting. Okay. It's a trend. It's a fad. It's very real. And it's very real because it's how our body is hardwired to actually work. Mm. When we're sleeping, we're actually not eating. We're fasting. And that's mm -hmm. why they call it break fast, breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. But if you want to actually, uh, and by the way, so here's the other thing. When you're not eating, your insulin goes down. Mm -hmm. right? When your insulin goes down, your metabolism shifts gears all right, into fat burning mode. So here's the deal. During the day when we're eating, put food in your mouth, insulin goes up. Tell them, it goes, hey, it's time to store some fuel. All right, it switches into fuel storing mode. It's going to take that energy, move it into your cells, store extra energy in a fat. So you're, you're, you're putting into your fuel tank. You're putting fuel in your fuel tank naturally. But when you're sleeping, not eating, i.e. fasting, your metabolism switch gears to say, let's go burn. Let's go burn it down. So when you're sleeping, this is good. you're actually burning fat. Mm. Now, Here's the thing. Well, that basically most, when you're not eating is what you're when saying. When you're not eating. So you're saying when you eat, your body goes, we're going to store. And yep. when you are not eating, your body it goes, burns. we're going to burn. Yeah. So here's the thing. Some really simple ways to actually get mm. your body to do the heavy lifting for you from a metabolism, fighting fat kind of perspective. When the night before you go to sleep, eat dinner. Let's say you eat dinner at seven o'clock, eat for an hour, put your dishes away at eight o'clock. Don't snack. Don't eat after that. 
Okay. All right. And let's say you go to bed at 11 o'clock. I mean, I'm yeah. just going to say, and it's going to eight hours of sleep, 11 o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning. All right. That, during 11 to seven, when you're sleeping, you're going to be fat burning. You're burning. Uh, all right. Yeah. But if you don't ha snack after dinner from eight o'clock to 11, you've gained three extra hours Very of good. fat burning plus eight hours is 11 hours. And then here's what I do. All right. Knowing the science of how my body works. When I get up in the morning, I do not do what my mom taught me to do, which is get up, Roll down, eat some breakfast quickly, catch the school bus, get yeah. school in time. Yeah. I take my time. I, I take a shower. I get dressed. I will take a walk. I'll go check my emails, whatever it is. I wait for about an hour. And why do I do that? Three hours the night before, eight hours of sleep, plus one extra hour is 12 hours. Now I've spent 50% of my day. Burning. 12 out of 24, burning fat. Very good. That's actually letting your body do the heavy lifting Never, for you. Never, ever, ever heard it explained that way. All right. So when you're putting food in your mouth, you're storing. And yeah. when you're not doing that, you're burning. That's right. This is That's right. really simple, really good, Super and, makes, simple. and makes sense. Because I've had other people on the show go, no, the only reason you lose weight under intermittent fasting is it's caloric restriction because no. you're not eating as much. There's actually no. validity to smaller windows of fat storage telling your body when you're eating food as opposed exactly. to when you're burning. That's and when, really good. And by the way, and when you're eating... If you eat those foods that I write about in my book, Eat to Be Your Diet, mm -hmm. and there's 150 of them, by the way. There's a lot okay. of foods. Okay. Then you're actually eating foods that are going to trigger your brown fat. So the other 12 hours, let's say, that you're actually eating, really I'm going to come talk to the hours in a second, you're actually burning fat as well. Okay. You can, so you can, burn and, you can burn at night, and you can burn also uh, during the day when you're eating. The right foods that trigger The right that. foods. Now, one thing that I want to point out, because I know a lot of people probably listening to this will know something about intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. You know that 16 and eight mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing about intermittent mm -hmm. fasting? All right, two things. First of all, if you fat for 16 hours and you only eat eight, eight you're gonna lose some weight. You're gonna have mm -hmm. a lot of fat burning time. But if you only fast for 12, and you eat for 12, it still works. Yeah. You just, it doesn't okay. burn quite as intensely. Mm -hmm. And you know where that 16, eight came from? You ever hear the, you ever hear the real story, the no. backstory no. of why it's 16 and eight? No. This was not a clinical trial. Okay, although it's just been done, it does work in people. 16 and 8 came from a mouse study oh. in which the researcher that was doing the mouse study was a postdoc, okay, um, and she was in a relationship where the deal that they made of doing these feeding studies is this researcher was not going to be allowed to work in a lab <laughs> more than eight hours. And okay. so she fed the mice for eight hours and then and took all the food out and then went home to have a regular life. So it was relationship right? necessity, not some scientific exactly. formula. Exactly. And so while it does so while it does work, you know, a lot of people who aren't researchers don't realize how arbitrary mm. timelines are sometimes designed. It's like Researchers are people too, yeah. and they wind up actually, you know, bowing to the pressures of their significant other. So That's good. how 16 and 8 came about. Okay, so good. All right, last question I got for you. By the way, we need to do 100 of these interviews. I knew today was going to be different, but like I've done a lot of stuff on health and a lot of stuff on wellness, and um, I've learned a lot today, like a lot. I feel like we're stopping in the middle, don't you? Like, <laughs> oh, I feel yeah. like we're like on a roll. <laughs> But I want to do, I want to do, let's drop weight loss, let's drop fat burning, and let's just talk about aging. Okay. So like telomere length, things yeah. like that. Anything in our diets, in our nutrition that we should be doing to also reduce or slow the aging process? Or do these same things do that by just staying at the right body fat, the right body weight, anything in there? And you can throw alcohol in there if you want. Sure. Well, well here's the deal. Um... Aging, you know, we st we're starting to get old the moment we're born. A lot of people think, well, you know, I get 60 and above, I'm starting to age, and I want to live longer. Actually, our life fuse is starting to burn down, mm. okay? Uh, you know, we've lit the fuse the moment we actually are, get spanked and take our first breath, mm. right? Okay, so the, the issue is what, what do we do to ourselves that speed up our cells' natural aging process? So, you know, we're on a, we're on a clock no matter what. Mm -hmm. But we do do things in our lives that speed up uh, the burn, okay. all right? So the wick of the candle burns faster uh, okay. in certain things. What are some of those things? Smoking causes your cells to age much faster, which is why, by the way, people who smoke, their skin doesn't look good. That's just a Does that include manifestation. Cigars? Does that include cigars? What's that? Does it include cigars? Uh, well, that's a the cigars are sort of got a different. Just say no. <laughs> no, I'm, just... <laughs> I'm, just... I'm being prompted. <laughs> I'm okay, that's okay. that's what the that's what that's right, what the right, teleprompter so, says. All right, so all right. so smoke, smoking. All right. So smoking will actually make okay. you age faster. Drinking excess alcohol, too much alcohol. Look, 
uh, you know, some people say red wine's good, beer's good. It's true. There are some studies that show the benefits, but none of those benefits are due to the ethanol that's present in alcoholic beverages. Ethanol actually is a toxin for your cells. It causes your cells to age more quickly. Mm-hmm. All right. By the way, sun exposure, ultraviolet exposure also causes you to, to age more quickly. You know, anybody who's a sun worshiper, you don't have to go to a tanning salon to cause your age, your, your, your skin to age faster. All you have to be doing is going to the beach or even stuck in traffic in Los Angeles on the I-10 for hours, you will actually get, if on a sunny day, mm-hmm. you're, you know, so, wait, so what does your body have inside it to counter the speed up? Well, number one, our, our, our body's health defense, one of them is our DNA can fix itself. Mm-hmm. So when it's damaged by sunshine, cigarette smoke, alcohol, it will actually repair that damage. Mm-hmm. So how can we create better repairmen? How do we actually speed up the, 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 yeah. the, the fixing? Foods can actually do it. Okay. So tomatoes, for example, also watermelons, guava, have something called lycopene. Mm-hmm. It turns out that if you have uh, a glass of tomato juice or two slices of watermelon, an hour before you go out into the sun, go to the beach, it'll protect your DNA from damage, from the aging damage wow. from the sun by 60%. Okay. All right. Before. Okay. Doesn't fix it afterwards. Yeah. It'll fix it before. But there are some other things that can actually fix it afterwards. So watermelon is a prophylactic from UV rays. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, a, it's a lycopene that's okay. actually in it. So we, okay. those of us who study food as medicine, we're diving in to figure out what it is mm. that's, that's there. And by the way, a watermelon also is full of water, so it hydrates you, so it also prevents you from getting dehydrated, right? right? So yep. again, this is better than getting lycopene pills before you pop out into the sun. Back to the whole argument of like, okay, what's the, what's the totality mm. of the food that we're eating? Mm. Okay, so um, the other thing about uh, the thing that can actually help to slow down the burn rate of the fuse naturally, this is what's amazing to me. It turns out coffee, drinking coffee, anywhere from a cup to four cups a day, will slow down the burn of your life fuse. Wow. Okay. And in fact, coffee, some studies have shown that coffees can reverse the burn. What? It's like increasing the wick. You wow. can gain months or even years with coffee drinking if, when you measure the burn rate on your cells. It's pretty amazing. Wow, that's amazing. Now, you can't be putting chemicals in there. So you, you know, the, that incredible pumpkin, seasonal pumpkin <laughs> flavor, that's not what I'm talking about. Right. Adding, you know, a whole bunch of sugar, mm-hmm. adding a whole bunch of cream. I'm not, that's mm-hmm. what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about coffee. Yeah, sure. By the way, what's in coffee that helps out? There's some, we've, we've figured it out. There's something called chlorogenic acid, among many other things. Okay. Chlorogenic acid is present in coffee beans. It's also present in apples and pears as well. But it's present in coffee. It seems to be slowing down the burn rate of your aging. Amazing. Now, how do you get more chlorogenic acid in your coffee? What's the best coffee to have? Organic coffee. Okay. Okay. Now, you know why? Mm. Because chlorogenic acid actually is produced by the coffee plant, like many of these other natural chemicals, bioactives, in response to being injured by bugs. So when, when insects nibble on the leaves and stems of the coffee plant, the strawberry, whatever plant you're talking about, okay, which is organic growth, no pesticides, bugs are swarming everywhere, nibbling on the leaves. They produce more chlorogenic acid and other bioactives as a defense mechanism. It's the plant's defense. Mm-hmm. So when you actually spray with pesticides, hey, fewer bugs. Don't need to make as much, right? Mm-hmm. That's, this is why organic is actually better for you. I, I was a big skeptic of organic, Ed. I'm like, I don't want to be paying more money to have right. less harmful stuff to my body. That's real reason. But mm-hmm. I am willing to pay more money. To, to have longer. more good stuff. Me too. And to live longer. Yeah. So am I. Um, I want to say something to you. Today's episode has caused people to live better and longer. I know this. Everyone's listening. They're like, would you please have him back? Because I don't, you kind of feel like we're just getting like, like we're just tapping the surface of this food as medicine. This is the idea. appetizer. This is the appetizer. I like that. See, kept the food analogy. He's good, people. He's good. I'm telling you, I really learned a lot today. And I know when I'm recording something, when like the share button's going off, it's sort of a sickness that I have and my producers are nodding too, but I kind of know during an episode, okay, that got shared, that got shared, that got shared, that got shared. And I'm also so sick. I'm like, that's an Instagram clip. That's an Instagram clip. There's like 900 clips in this interview already. And so I'm so grateful to, I guess it's Rich Devinney that connected us, but a lot of different people did. So Rich, thank you for today. Dr. William Lee, you are amazing, buddy. You are amazing. And you guys should go get his book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, Burn Fat, Heal Your Metabolism, and Live Longer. Grab the power of one more by this Ed Milet guy while you're grabbing his book. And please share today's episode. Thank you so much. For Thanks today. for having me on. It was so good. Like, it was a maxed out hour. It was awesome. All right, God bless you, everybody. Share the show. Take care. We'll see you next week.